Hello, my name is Andy Henson. I'm the Director of the Department for International Liaison and Communication at the BIPM. Welcome to World Metrology Day 2020. I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the history of World Metrology Day and then a little bit about the theme for this year, which is round trade. So World Metrology Day is the annual celebration of the signing of the Meter Convention, which occurred on the 20th of May 1875, uh, so quite a long time ago now. Um, we use the, the occasion uh, to raise awareness about the importance of metrology, and that can be amongst the, uh, the institutes ourselves, a, a little celebration, but also uh, it might be amongst the ministries or decision makers or interested stakeholders from industry, scientists, academics, and the public at large. So it gives us an opportunity to talk about what we do, about the value of accurate and internationally accepted measurements. Um, and a little bit more, perhaps, about the metrology system that sits hidden uh, behind the scenes and its importance in exploiting the opportunities and addressing, addressing the challenges of the modern world. Um, I should say straight away that we operate this project, the World Metrology Day project, jointly with the OIML, so the, the metrology community comes together for World Metrology Day. Um, World Metrology Day as a, a celebration began uh, in, in the year 2000 and actually the BIPM wasn't very involved at that stage. Um, the origin was with the National Institute of South Africa, National Metrology Institute of South Africa. Um, they took the initiative because particularly in Africa uh, there was a, still is, a need to raise awareness. And you see some of the examples from the early days on the left, the first poster in 2000. Uh, it became a BIPM project in 2007 and the following year, uh, 2008, OIML joined in and it became a joint project. So if we skip forward a few years, uh, we ran uh, through in a fairly similar vein through to 2014 and in that year we decided to team up with the regional metrology organisations uh, and rotate around them so each of them would work with one or more NMIs to help design the poster and talk about the theme and, and so on. Uh, and you see some of the posters running through uh, with the different themes chosen each year, sometimes to match uh, major uh, international um, celebrations like the Year of Light. Uh, right through to 2020, um, with the poster that you have there, which was uh, uh, done actually with the authorities in Egypt, uh, who's our partner for 2020. So we use this as an opportunity to promote uh, the things that we're doing and uh, trade is all around promoting sustainable and economic development these days. Um, now, so the, the companies that are out there making goods and providing services are using a series of things. They're using uh, certification and inspection, they're using testing and they're using calibration. Um, and that's generally done by service providers uh, in many countries, it's uh, a private sector. In others, they, they might be public bodies, but often private sector. So they're the service providers. And building around the service providers, of course, in our world, in the world of calibration, they're taking metrological traceability typically from their own National Metrology Institute, but it doesn't need to be. We have the CIPM MRA nowadays, so it's easy to go somewhere else for, for metrological traceability. So we have the National Metrology Institute. We have also accreditation and national standards bodies because we're talking about uh, a holistic quality infrastructure now, not just about the, the metrology. Metrology is part of that. These bodies in turn uh, invariably uh, collaborate in some way at a regional level. Uh, for us it's the regional metrology organisations, which we have six now, um, and, uh, but the same for the other elements of the quality infrastructure. They generally have uh, some regional collaboration as well. And outside of that, in, in my uh, uh, sphere here, in my world here, uh, we have the international and inter intergovernmental organisations like the BIPM and the OIML. And of course, you have others for uh, accreditation and documentary standards. In fact, there are more than this, but these are the key ones that I've uh, put on the screen here that you can see. OK, so we've understood the world of quality infrastructure. And let's focus back again on metrology. I would say it has three core influences. The first is in science and innovation, um, and that's a symbiotic one. If you can measure better, you can do better science. If you do better science, you can do better measurement. So it's a really, really uh, strong relationship there to help drive uh, research and, and innovation. Uh, quality of life, there's many measure, me measurements you need to make, whether it's contaminants in, in food, whether it's trying to monitor the climate, and very tip topically uh, today is, of course, the, that of health and uh, 
ensuring that measurements are right and appropriate uh, for things like fighting the COVID-19. Uh, the tra tradition of metrology, though, actually comes out more strongly from industry. And uh, it's been a, a major part of allowing the Industrial Revolution to really gather and part of the uh, global connected uh, chains that we have nowadays. Uh, they all rely on metrology. So I want to focus for just a few minutes on traded goods. That's, trade is the, the theme for 2020 for World Metrology Day. Uh, so traded goods, let's have a think about it. Okay, before you ever have a trade, you've got to have your goods in the first place. You've got to have your products. Um, so let's have a look at where metrology uh, contributes to that. You've got to have the right raw materials and you've got to know what those are. There's, you might have to be measuring all sorts of things, uh, a particular type of uh, steel, for example, uh, or it might even be um, uh, a, a plastic with the right properties. Uh, you have components that have to fit together. You have interoperability. Uh, when you, if you decide to go and build a mobile phone, you've got, it's got to be able to connect to networks and so on, and that means uh, the precise construction of the devices. Of course, uh, the metrology also helps you with your ideas and your design. You have to be able to actually manufacture to very fine tolerances and so on to try and get a better product than you had before. The other thing you want to do is uh, manufacture efficiently. You want to really reduce waste and downtime. Uh, again, getting the measurements right really, really help with this. Um, so, okay, now we say we, we've got a great idea for a product, we've got our goods and we've manufactured it efficiently. So we're ready to go and sell it into the world market. So let's see where we need to think now. Well, of course, if you're going to sell it into a world market, you're going to be crossing uh, international barriers, uh, international borders. Uh, so that means the, you, you are exporting, uh, import in the receiving country, There's some logistics associated with that. You've got to get it distributed to the right place at the right time. Okay, so this brings in some other things. There's regulatory requirements. If you're selling into another market, you have to meet their regulatory requirements. They may be aligned, they may not be aligned with yours. Um, you've also got to have value for money and you've got to meet the expectations of the customer. It's not enough just to pass the regulatory barrier. You've got to also have a product that somebody's going to buy. So the, uh, uh, with the metrology and the testing that goes with this, you're trying to achieve uh, a number of things. You're trying to make sure that you are able to place your products onto the market, the regulatory barriers, but also you've got to get the right balance of quality and price so that somebody goes and buys your product. Um, now, one has to be careful here. Um, if you take the example of a car, you can sell a top-end sports car at a huge price and make a profit, or you can sell something much more modest further down, uh, down the, the, the chain, as it were, and, and still make a profit. It's the balance of quality and price that uh, is the attractive feature that you've got, got to get right. Of course, all of them have to meet the regulatory requirements, otherwise you have no market access. Um, in the background are bodies like the uh, WTO. Um, uh, they help try and avoid uh, discriminatory barriers to international trade. Um, and, and these days, many of the, the, the problems related to the conformity assessment practices what you don't want to have to do is pay the cost and bear the burden of having products retested when they arrive in a new market. You want your uh, measurements and your tests to be accepted and uh, the, the international recognition of conformity assessment practices, metrology is a key underpinning element of that. For us that means uh, ensuring good metrological traceability. Um, of course at the NMI level that's done through the CIPM MRA. It's not the only way of doing it I should say. Um, it's quite possible to have uh, traceability without the MRA, but there's a little bit more evidence involved. And in the international context, the MRA plays a pretty important role. It gives you an assurance of, of the quality. Um, again, for the commercial lab laboratories and for some NMIs as well, uh, accreditation plays an important role. And the two are intimately linked. The uh, uh, ILAC documents, the policy documents say, yes, you can go through the MRA to get your traceability from any, anywhere in the world that an NMI has the appropriate capability. Um, so this uh, gives us the underpinning assurance in the, our, our confidence in, in the measurements and it allows us to go and say to the people at WTO, yes you, we, we agree you should be accepting tests that are carried out elsewhere. And one of the, my roles uh, and my staff is to go and actually sit down in the TBT committee of, of the WTO where we and OIML both have observer status. 
So here we are, our traded goods, and, and, and but let's look at some very specific uh, elements and think about things from a slightly different perspective. We have instruments that we trade as well. And uh, in legal metrology, that's very interesting because we what we do there is we build in our uh, knowledge of uncertainty into the instrument itself. And the reason that we can do that is because we have a dedicated instrument for a dedicated application. So uh, a meter on a petrol pump or shop scales or an electricity meter or a gas meter, you know what the, uh, uh, the meter is going to do, you know precisely the type of conditions it's going to do it in. And that means you can build in the metrological knowledge of the uncertainty into that. And, and that's uh, done to, to be through a type testing type of uh, process, um, which makes it much easier to ensure once it's out on the market, the checking becomes far easier than having to uh, uh, repeat all, all the metrological aspects of, of that. So dedicated instrument for a dedicated application. But there's many regulatory circumstances where there is not a specific legal requirement on the instrument itself. The requirement is on the result of the measurement. So here you have perhaps a little bit more flexibility. It's a little bit easier to think of different ways to do the measurements. They have to be appropriate. You have to demonstrate to somebody, a regulator, typically that uh, what you're doing is okay. The point I made earlier, we mustn't forget, just passing the regulatory hurdle doesn't get you anywhere. It gets you access into the market, but it doesn't mean anyone's going to buy, buy your product. So you've still got to never forget this customer quality price. So they have their expectations. And of course, they'll have some specifications very typically, which aren't anything to do with regulation. It's about how the product performs. Um, so that here we are. These are... Uh, in some sort of market where there is a regulatory requirement, but it's not telling you you have to use a specific defined instrument that has been type tested and approved and so on. Then we moved into the field of, uh, there are some products where there is no real regulation or rather limited regulation. Often there's, it's not as black and white as I've drawn it in my diagram. Um, here, uh, uh, really it's up to you how much effort you want to put in to make a, um, a watch of absolute precision or one of less precision, that's your choice. And uh, if we go back uh, before the, the days of uh, the, the uh, quartz watches, um, it was the precision engineering, for example, in Switzerland that allowed them to make a high value product and uh, extra money. But you could make watches of slightly lower quality and sell them for a lower price as well. So here the measurements, are, the uncertainty is bespoke. You choose how good you want to make the measurements and consequently the types of instrumentation and expertise that you'll use to get the um, result that you want. I can't uh, finish today's talk without mentioning the current situation that we're in. So that's the, the current crisis um, for the, the uh, COVID-19. This is uh, uh, the reason that I'm talking to you, uh, not from uh, the BIPM, but actually from, uh, from my home uh, right now. Although we have, I'm glad to say, we started work in the laboratories at the BIPM. There are NMIs all around the world that are providing things like the uh, reference materials, they're working absolutely flat out to get these in place. Some of them are already there uh, that are crucially needed. So, for example, the SIR, uh, the COVID to RNA reference materials for the monoclonal antibody references, reference materials. Uh, there are people working on other things. Um, CCQM is busy looking at uh, the protocols for organizing comparisons to underpin uh, the, uh, the science behind this um, and also planning workshops and webinars for, for the community. Um, we have also NMIs providing, of course, validation and calibration and verification of measurement instruments for personal protective equipment. Uh, many NMIs have been very, very involved in this. Uh, um, equipment needs to be, needs to be sure that it really performs the way that we want it to perform. And uh, there are people working hard at that. And of course, in the clinical, um, uh, so sorry, for, uh, ventilators, I, I, I've got uh, ventilators. Of course, you manufacture a ventilator. It's quite a high demand instrument. It's got wide variety of requirements and measurement and testing is clearly an element of that. Last but not least, uh, the clinical treatment, when the patient is actually in the hospital, they are subject to a, a huge amount of measurements. So you, uh, we have all seen the pictures of people connected up to the monitors. Uh, those all have to perform uh, accurately and the measurements have to be reliable to, so that the clinicians can make the right decisions on, on what to do next. So hopefully a situation that will pass um, and, and uh, we will come out through the far side. It won't be quick. Um, 
and it's not been easy for any of us. Uh, but the measurement world is doing its part in to try and uh, improve the situation. I invite you now to, uh, to, of course, visit the World Metrology Day website. You'll find some messages uh, um, in, in the form of short video clips from the uh, CIPM president, the CIML president, the IPM director, and, and so on. Uh, there are posters uh, from around the world. It's, uh, uh, there are uh, events, from uh, many of them virtual this year, uh, listed from around the world as well. So there we are. Um, let me say thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today and wish you a very uh, happy uh, World Metrology Day 2020. Thank you very much.